Though not emissaries of the heavens, as their name suggests. Or maybe they are. I don't know. Angel insects are just as cryptic and puzzling, eluding elucidation for over a hundred years, and minding their own business and rotting logs for another hundred million more. Welcome to the Insect Spotlight Project, a channel dedicated to shining a light on insects, spiders, or any other creepy crawlies that get left out of the ecologic spotlight. So today we're talking about the order Zoraptera, better known as the angel insects. Honestly, I was sort of hoping that by the time we got to this order, there'd be a little bit more information on them. They have the wonderful combination of being understudied, tiny in size, very generic in morphology, and a fairly complex ecology. And it's not like this is a very recently described order, like say the Mantaphasmatodia. The Zoraptera were discovered back in the early 1900s, which is still pretty late in the game compared to other insect orders, but we've had a whole hundred plus years to learn about these guys. But to be fair, there's only around 30 to 50 species of Zoraptoran. But also to be fair, it's not like they're only found in these remote little corners of the world. They can be found in Africa, Asia, South America, even the United States. But also to be fair, they're only like a couple millimeters long, so, you know. To add to their mystery, we aren't really sure where they fall in the insect family tree. Their genetics are fuzzy at best, but seem to lean us toward the Dictyoptera, which is the superorder containing the roaches, the termites, and the mantids, or the Dermaptera, which is the earwigs. However, there is an argument to be made for the web spinners, the Embioptera, as potential synapomorphies have been found between these two groups. A synapomorphy is a pretty unique shared characteristic that seems to have come from a common ancestor. In this case, both these orders share a pretty uniquely structured wing base. But you have to be careful. Sometimes what seems like a synapomorphy can really be convergent evolution. Convergent evolution is where similar traits evolve due to similar environmental pressures. Birds and bats both have wings, but they evolved these independently, so this is not a synapomorphy, it's convergent evolution. But I digress. For this video, let's do what we did for the Strepsiptera. We're going to go over the life cycle and ecology first, and then we'll round back on how to ID these guys. The Zoraptera are hemimetabolous, meaning they have an incomplete three-stage metamorphosis, from egg to nymph to adult. Zoraptorans live in communal societies, normally in rotting logs and the like. And these societies can be anywhere from 20 individuals to over 100. Sometimes if you're lucky, you can even find them in piles of old sawdust left to sit. Being tucked away in this woody debris, the eggs are pretty well protected. From the few case studies we're drawing from, these eggs can take over a month before hatching into nymphs. The nymphs look like smaller versions of the adults. They'll feed on fungal spores, rotting plant matter, and even tiny invertebrates like springtails until they reach reproductive maturity. But here's the tricky part though. Angel insects come in two forms. Most angel insects you'll come across are going to be wingless, but this makes dispersal difficult. So to get around this, Zoraptorans will once in a while create winged offspring, which leave the colony once they reach adulthood. This seems to be linked to environmental conditions. When conditions are favorable, wingless forms are produced. When the conditions are less favorable, winged forms are produced so they can disperse to more favorable conditions. Once they find a new spot though, they go ahead and break off the wings, so it's not easy to find winged Zoraptorans. But you can actually tell a winged form from a wingless one even in the freshly hatched nymphs as the early signs of wing development are already present. Early signs of wing development in immature stages are referred to as wing buds. Both males and females can be either winged or wingless, and regardless of wing presence, all Zoraptorans have the capability to reproduce. But that doesn't mean that they all get to reproduce. Zoraptoran societies are more like roommates than an organized unit. We call them gregarious, they live together, but there's no real social structure there. In fact, if you find a colony of Zoraptorans and you toss in some random Zoraptorans from down the street, they won't even be able to tell each other apart. This is unlike things like ants where they get drawn and quartered. They do interact though, 
Zoraptorans will spend a lot of their time grooming one another to prevent disease, which makes sense when you're living in such close quarters. But it isn't all rainbows and butterflies. Like most roommates, Zoraptorans also have their scuffles. Male Zoraptorans have been shown to accumulate harems of females, and they're very protective, which makes sense because repeated matings have been shown to increase fecundity, or potential offspring production. Males will headbutt, kick, and wrestle any perceived challenger, creating a sort of hierarchical structure. Hierarchical. Hierarchical. Dominant males garner more females, and subordinate males are really just trying to avoid conflict. But don't feel too bad though, males will often achieve more dominant roles in the community as they grow older. In terms of actual mating, it can be surprisingly variable across species. Some species have gone down interesting rabbit holes, with long and highly coiled female reproductive systems, or the males secreting a liquid from their head as a nuptial gift for the females. Or, in the case of Spermazorus impolitis, the males will deposit a spermatophore, basically a package of sperm, with a single giant sperm cell. Just one spermatozoan. To be fair, they will usually deposit multiple of these packages. Fun fact, this spermatozoan is about as long as the female herself. So, do with that what you will. Where do you even go from here? Uh, the females go ahead and lay eggs, but not many of them. Only like 20 or so across their lifetime. I guess life moves slow when you're roaming around eating fungal spores. Anyway, here's how you identify them. As you can see here, they look like a bug. Like you look at it and you're like, yeah, that's an insect probably. In all seriousness, they do look pretty generic, especially at their size, but that doesn't mean all hope is lost. Remember, most of the Zoraptorans you're going to come across are going to be the wingless forms. So they're going to be blind, pale in color, of course very small, only a couple millimeters long, and they're going to have maniliform antennae, where each segment is rounded and pretty equal in size, like a string of beads. Also, the fact that they're wingless already eliminates a ton of other options. And remember to keep in mind the habitat you're finding them in and whether there are other individuals present. You could get them confused with worker termites, but luckily both of these groups live communally. So there should be a little bit more variability in the termite colony, and the Zoraptorans will also be much smaller in size. You could also get it confused with book lice, but the antennae are different. I've also seen people get them confused with Diplura. But Diplura have these long cerci on the back of them, where Zoraptora cerci are barely visible. However, Diplurin Cersei can sometimes fall off, so also keep in mind they're a lot more elongate. Diplura used to be an insect group. They're no longer considered insects. We'll get into that in another video. The winged Zoraptorans are going to look similar, but they're going to be darker in color and have compound eyes. And if you find one with the wings intact, you'll notice they're oval-shaped with heavily reduced venation. But good luck finding one. To really drive this point home, when scientists first came across this group, they assumed all the individuals were wingless. This led to their scientific name, Zoraptora. Zoros meaning pure, and Aptera meaning without wings. A without, Teron wings. So Zoraptora means purely wingless. The whole pure thing also seems to have led to their common name, angel insects. Now I've also heard them called ground lice. But lice is a confusing enough group as it is, so I for one am only going to be using the name Angel Insects. I highly doubt I could find a single person with a legitimate reason on how Zoraptorans negatively impact them. The only thing I can think of is that you're really attached to a sawdust pile and you don't want bugs all up in it. In terms of how they benefit us, nutrient cycling. They eat up all sorts of debris in these rotting wood piles and cycle it back into the environment. Taking hard to access nutrients and making them easier to access is what makes the world go round. So if you want to help the angel insects or just have a chance at seeing them, you need to preserve the woody debris on your property. There are whole communities of organisms that rely on rotting wood. So don't go trashing the logs on your property. That's a valuable resource and an important component of a balanced ecosystem. And preserve your leaf litter too while you're at it. Thank you all so much for listening. These obscure orders are so much fun to cover, and I really hope they're just as fun to watch. 
So if you enjoy the content, please remember to like and subscribe to keep up to date with future videos. Also, if you have any other fun facts about angel insects or any personal experiences with them, please leave a comment below. I'd love to hear about it. Peace, y'all.